have uh, Tim, who is giving his presentation on how to secure your API, the OASP uh, API security top 10. So let me share your video feed, Tim. Awesome. Awesome, there you are. So, those know, Tim has spent the last nine years developing and supporting multiple backend, front end, and mobile code bases. He loves finding tools and tricks to develop quality software. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Lee. Um, it's, it's awesome to be able to talk about something that's really cool uh, to me, which is APIs and being able to make sure we're developing secure code. Um, it's, it's one of those things that doesn't quite fall into, you know, the tips and tricks and tools, but um, as time has gone on, I've realized, you know, it's probably better to write code that, you know, doesn't have glaring security issues um, and, you know, exposes people's personal information um, all over the internet um, versus, you know, something that saves me five minutes once a week. So thank you all for, for attending this. Um, again, this is Secure Your API, the OWASP API Security Top 10. My name is Tim Jarzombek. I am a software developer. I'm uh, living and presenting out of my house uh, in, uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I say I'm full stack-ish. Um, I really do a lot of C-sharp development, uh, but I've had to you know, jump in and do some things in Angular um, I've done some stuff with mobile apps in the past. Um, I really like the, to work on REST APIs. Those are kind of my jam. Um, I'm not a security expert. That's one thing I'm going to say flat out. Um, but I do think that security is like everyone, especially every developer, it should be a part of their job. Um, because of the things that we deal with day in, day out, um, with the code that we write, we should be mindful of um, the data that we we're holding on to and, you know, potentially exposing. Um, you guys can find me on the internet. Um, surprise, surprise. Uh, my email is tim at jars.net and you can find me on Twitter at tim underscore jars. Um, I have a website, but it is hopelessly out of date, so I'm not going to post it. Um, so diving in, I want to first talk a little bit about OWASP. Um, so you guys may recognize the name OWASP or the logo. Pretty cool logo, I have to say. Um, it's the Open Web Application Security Project. Uh, they've been around since uh, the early 2000s. It's a community-led group. Um, I think they're just about to have some board member elections. Uh, they do a lot of open source work, um, both in code, uh, like the um, dev slot or the um, Juice Shop uh, is the like buggiest juice shop uh, on the planet, um, written in JavaScript. A really cool way to kind of dig in and understand um, vulnerabilities in software. Um, but they also have documentation that is open source and community developed, like what I'm about to talk about. Um, overall, though, there's over 275 chapters um, across the world. Um, I know there's a local one here in Indianapolis. I was a horrible person and didn't remember to look up the closest ones uh, to you guys in Northern Virginia. I apologize. Um, but you guys may recognize uh, OWASP, the name, uh, from the top 10 web application security risks. Uh, that's been a really popular document since the early 2000s. Um, detailing, you know, what are the biggest issues going on uh, in, in web software that's being developed and, and pushed out. Um, I know anytime I've done um, any sort of like penetration tests of my own software, um, I usually get references back to the OWASP top 10 as it's been kind of the canonical document. Um, so why a different top 10 than that, uh, just for APIs? There are a lot of similarities. Um, we've got a client and a server talking back and forth. It's you know a browser and you know your .NET stack or your Java stack or your Node stack or your serverless stack. Um, and there, there's always going to be things like input validation and sanitization and you know little lobby tables is always going to pop up somewhere, um, regardless of front end or sorry not front end, regardless of traditional web application architecture or the more common now uh, REST API architecture. We do have some differences. 
Um, those traditional web applications typically are kind of a one big request that goes across from the client side over to the server. Server does a lot of stuff and then sends back the giant request, or sorry, giant response. Um, usually cookies are involved, um, all that fun stuff. Um, there's sessions. Um, with RESTful APIs, um, there's usually a lot more back and forth. You know, you've got kind of like the ajax -y things going on where you've got maybe a single page application making lots of little requests, fetching data, uh, kind of in partials, loading things up on the screen um, as data comes back in. Um, not really necessarily having the same amount of like session data or context, you know, on every request, um, or it's a little more difficult to figure those things out. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to go through and show you the top 10. We've got a couple of things relating to authorization and authentication, um, the data that's, go that's going out there into the world, um, some misconfiguration, um, you know, some asset management and some logging issues. Um, but I'm going to just for the rest of the talk kind of dive in into each one of these um, items and hopefully give you guys the things you need to know to succeed uh, in, in avoiding them or mitigating them in your software. So first off is the uh, broken object level authorization. Um, goes by API 1 2019. Um, if you're, I guess, in the know, um, that's the shorthand, which is also very complicated. Um, but you can see here, APIs tend to expose endpoints handling object IDs, creating a wide surface area, surface level X control issue. Um, we should be doing auth checks um, in every function that accesses data sources using inputs from users. Um, all of these items have some ratings um, on exploitability, uh, prevalence, detectability, and the tech impacts of them. Um, so you can see here that this is an easily exploitable thing, and I'll show you in just a few moments, um, you know, how it's easy to exploit. It's also very widespread. Um, almost all web application or web APIs have this sort of issue um, when they're first released. Um, it's something just as developers, it's really easy to, to neglect this. Um, these average. It takes a little bit of knowledge to be able to, you know, find these. Um, it isn't, you know, something that is seen, you know, very plainly when looking at the, re the response coming back from, uh, from an API. Uh, but the tech impact is severe. Um, it can do a lot of damage to your system um, with the data that's inside of it. So, in other words, other than that giant blob of text, most API endpoints that developers write, we've got IDs in them. We're re referencing the entity ID. So in this case, you know, I'm looking to get data on user 38938. It's super easy to, you know, observe that um, in your browser's dev tools and then just start playing around and swapping things and say, okay, I'm going to try getting user ID one. And, you know, the first user ID usually is a special user, um, usually admin privileges. So, Pretty, um, a pretty easy target. Um, that said, you know, it's even worse when you're using IDs that can be easily enumerated, like integers, just, you know, start from one and see what happens. Um, there's a couple of times that you kind of see that throughout the presentation and vulnerabilities. Um, this is the most common API vulnerability that's out there today. Um, this is the sort of thing that um, is, is kind of like the low hanging fruit, um, I think. Um, it's something that developers can can hopefully um, kind of take away as a big thing to focus on um, just because of things like the impact. Implications of this um, are pretty straightforward. Um, you can have unauthorized data, data access. So, you know, data going out that you don't want to, maybe it doesn't belong to that user that's, that's accessing it. Or um, you can even have a data modification uh, in the very worst case, you can do things like, you know, have account takeovers happen. Um, in the super worst case, the admin accounts get taken over and then you're, you're hosed. You're just completely out of luck at that point. Um, so going through some examples, first we've got one from Uber. Uh, you can see here is a request. You can see here that 
um, that we're making a request to a particular endpoint. Let me see if I can get this laser thing to work. Oh, cool, it's working. So you can see we're making a call to this ad driver endpoint. And what we're just doing is passing in a phone number right here. It doesn't matter like who you are making this request or anything like that. Um, any user logged in is going to be able to make this request. And they'll get back a, a failure message here saying, hey, I didn't find a driver with that unique ID. So now I know unique ID. Uh, the same thing happens in another endpoint uh, just with the email address. Again, I don't know who that, um, I didn't find that account as a driver in, in the database is what the Uber API comes back and tells us. So now I've got unique IDs. This will actually come back uh, in uh, two more examples or two or three more, more uh, examples. Um, we also have another example from the same guy, Anand Prakash. Um, he's come up with a lot of different um, things. He now uh, has like his own security company. Um, but you can see um, what's actually going on right now is um, there's a note in Facebook that he's created as one user. He's now logged into another account um, to edit a note. He's using a tool called Burp Suite. Uh, and what it's doing is intercepting the re requests and responses from Facebook. And what he was able to do was just switch out the IDs from, um, from Facebook. So now when he goes, the victim's note is no longer found because he was able to take just that ID in the URL and place it into the request of Facebook. And there wasn't enough authorization checks going on. Um, so broken up object level authorization, we can prevent it doing things like implementing robust authorization. Um, and there's kind of different ways we can do that. First straightforward way, the way I recommend to start out with is just based on user types. Um, you can get more complex into role-based assignment. Um, maybe, you know, people can only do certain things on certain objects. Um, that gets uh, to be a lot more complicated and kind of, you can make it uh, you can accidentally introduce bugs into that. So only go that route if you're gonna, you know, need that for a business functionality. Um, but always use this. Um, you can kind of do a secure by default mode by learning about your application's middleware. So I'm an ASP.NET developer normally. So there's a way to put authorization in before any of my controllers get hit. Therefore, I can make sure that all my requests are properly um, authenticated or authorized. Um, make sure you do this validation through the entire stack though. There's definitely places where depending on, you know, the authorization types that you're using, you may be able to also include those user IDs, you know, when selecting data out of the database. That way, um, you know, it's to your application, yeah, that entity doesn't exist um, in the messages that come back, not this exists, but you can't get to it. Um, doing a little fun information disclosure there. Um, I also recommend, you know, reducing your exposure through using things like GUIDs. Um, it could be kind of considered security by obscurity. Um, and I'd say, yeah, it is security by obscurity. That's the only thing you're doing, but it's part of a good defense in depth uh, sort of approach to your application uh, development. And also please test this. Um, unit integration and functional testing, that is all great. Um, full test coverage, you know, writing all the unit tests to cover it all is great. Um, awesome if you're able to do 100% full code coverage, but make sure you're actually testing it out in the environment, making sure that it is configured correctly. Um, I've run into this where I thought I've had it set up correctly, and I go and I start poking around like, oh no, this thing isn't live in this environment because of this environment setting not set up, those sorts of things. Moving on to API 2, broken user authentication. Um, this allows attackers to compromise auth tokens or exploit bugs uh, to assume other users' identities. Um, this can overall, again, be a big issue. Um, it's super easy to exploit when it's found. It's fairly common to find uh, issues with this. Um, detectability takes a little work. Um, it's not super easy, it's not super difficult, it's right there in the middle. Uh, but the technical impact is severe. Uh, one thing you'll note is, so this is authentication. The first slide was talking about authorization. 
I do want to take a quick detour to talk about the difference between authorization or authn versus authorization or authz. Now, you know authn and authz, you can be all cool and hip and say, oh yeah, I know it there. Um, authentication, again, authn. It's validating who the person is or who whatever entity is on the other end of the wire. So it's things like, you know, the username um, plus the password. Um, text codes, smart cards, UB keys, those sorts of things. Those are all ways to help authenticate, uh, improve who the person on the other end of, of the network cable is. Authorization is actually giving permissions, um, saying that an entity, um, a user service can or can't access a specific resource or function. What can you do? And this depends on every API ever. Like, you can't necessarily give a hard and fast rule about um, things you can do. You can make this be based on things like users, uh, individuals, or groups of users kind of put together. Um, a good example is house sitting. I'm actually about to take a couple of days away since I've been, you know, in this house for forever because of Corona. Um, we're going to have friends watch your cats or rather a cat, thank God we only have one. Um, we've got authentication. A uh, friend can open the door based off a key um, or a you know garage code, or maybe uh, I use my fancy smart lock and give them a code and all that sort of stuff. Um, that's based off of possession though. Like they need to have the key, they need to have their smartphone with them so they can hit the button to unlock the door. Authorization, feeding the cat, um, is actually related to permissions, though. Like my friend would have permission to go into the pantry to get the cat food, um, those sorts of things. Um, authorization precludes things like, you know, I, or the, my friend wouldn't be authorized to um, say, ha watch pay-per-view. I mean, I only have Netflix, so I can't really do that. But um, things like that, host a, host a giant bonfire in my backyard. Um, it'd be nice to, for them to get rid of all these leaves and branches, but you know, I'd rather enjoy it with them. Ending the detour, back to our regularly scheduled vulnerabilities and such. So again, broken user authentication. Uh, in other words, there's two aspects to this. First is implementation. Sensitive authorization details, or sorry, authentication details. I'm gonna apologize, I'm gonna accidentally say the wrong one a couple of times, most likely. Um, one is the auth tokens and URLs. Um, one of the very common OAuth, or sorry, OpenID Connect flows involves sending access tokens back in a URL to the calling application um, as part of the redirect process once the user is logged in. Um, but you could be missing token validation. Um, working with those JWTs or JSON web tokens um, that most authentication providers give us back now, um, they're signed. We should be validating those signatures. And we should also be, be validating that those tokens haven't expired yet. Um, two very important things that can be accidentally missed based off of just kind of default configurations. If you do happen to be doing authentication in your application, um, you know, having unsecured passwords in your database with either no hashing, which is super bad, or weak hashing, which is just very slightly better. Um, that can, that's an example of this, um, as well as even just using the wrong authentication mechanism. Saying you're using the, the old school basic authentication with, you know, username, colon, password, um, base64 encoded, thrown into a header, um, or an API to talk to your application, uh, instead of, you know, using application keys that can be rotated and that sort of stuff. The other side of this is endpoint protection. Um, this goes into, you know, enhanced security, or sorry, uh, needing to add enhanced security to things like forgot password flow. Or maybe you've got those fancy one-click links and emails that get sent out that go deep linking into, you know, a particular page in your application and auto-authenticate somebody. You know, you want to be making sure that those code flows have been tested and validated and make sure that there aren't any weaknesses to them. Um, you also have brute force attacks, which, you know, we're kind of familiar with from just being on the internet for plenty of years, um, you know, just trying tons of usernames and passwords. 
But there's now a variant on this called credential stuffing based off of all these lovely databases that have leaked onto the internet. Um, people, you know, having the same email addresses and using the same passwords again and again and again. Now attackers are able to say, okay, cool. I now know what passwords these people are use. I'm going to try those instead to get into, you know, their accounts. So, you know, a new variation on an old attack. Um, implications of broken user authentication are pretty obvious. An, an, an unauthorized person can get into an account. They can do things like maybe read or send messages, buy things, uh, access the personal data. Um, again, if it's like online shopping, OK, cool. Now I can see this person's address. Um, super, super fun stuff. Um, I've got two examples for broken user authentication. The first is actually from Alt Zero, who is a great company. Um, it shows how hard this stuff is. Um, but they had one random code path written a long time ago that uh, wasn't doing a case insensitive check on something, um, which allowed a match on the unsigned uh, token verification, which is a way that you can you know, specify tokens um, through, through JWT. There's like two or three different ways, and unsigned is unfortunately one of the ways that you can specify one of these was signed. Um, but they, this was found by Insomnia Security, and what they found was, again, they could just change some of the case. Uh, this font is a little weird, or PowerPoint's weird, but you know, if you took you know, the E and ALG, none, and just capitalized that, um, that would allow this to work, which you know, is kind of a silly thing, but um, you know, I feel like a lot, as me as a developer, I tend to you know, just kind of go through quickly the, the hack cases. Um, this also happened to Apple. Um, found earlier this year that in the fairly new sign in with Apple um, protocol, which is based off OpenID Connect, um, just hitting a particular Apple endpoint, you know, hopefully they they hit it um, with an email address, they would actually get back an entire real valid um, token here. Here's the ID token um, and grant information. So you know, that's that's kind of only a big deal. Just having somebody's email and saying, OK, cool. And now I've got your account information. Now I can act as you wherever these tokens are accepted. So. I've just talked about two examples of or companies that, you know, have security researchers and all that sort of stuff kind of messing this up. This stuff is hard. Um, not even specialists always get it right. But I consider using said specialists. They've got tons of resources. I mean, Apple's got a bajillion dollars. They've got people doing research, figuring out better ways to do this. Um, I know Auth0 worked recently on um, the Pixie flow, which is a way of improving that implicit grant approach where a token would come back in the URL and could be potentially captured. Um, it's really cool. Recommend you investigate using that. But also, it's a great way to kind of cover your own assets. Um, when I've talked about this with people, I'm like, I don't want to get the call at 2 a.m. saying, you know, people have signed in that can't or aren't supposed to be able to sign in, or this stuff just isn't even working. Um, at 2 a.m., my brain is way too foggy. I'm not going to be able to debug any of this. Um, so I feel like it's kind of nice to have those experts in your corner and be able to say, hey, expert, it's 2 a.m. Can you go figure this out, please? Thank you. Uh, prevention, though, on the implementation side, you need to kind of know your flows, know your login, logout, um, and any other authentication flows you may have implemented. Um, I also recommend learning the standards. Um, OAuth is not authentication, it's authorization. OpenID is authentication. And then you've got OpenID Connect, which kind of mirrors both of them together. Um, but use those standards. Um, lots of smart people have been poking at them and figuring out um, ways to to uh, penetrate uh, issues. So come on, just use them, please. Thank you. Um, I also recommend for endpoint protection, figuring out mitigations against brute force attacks. Um, that's things like rate limiting, captchas, lockouts, uh, and using multi-factor authentication uh, or allowing users to use that. Um, it's actually a great way to prevent those credential stuffing attacks because somebody may have a valid username and password based off another web application. But using multi-factor 
they hopefully won't also have the person's phone or else that person's got way more big issues. Moving on to the third, excessive data exposure. Developers tend to expose all object properties without considering their individual sensitivity because we're thinking ahead. They may need that. They may want that. Or I don't even know what the front end is going to want it to do on this page. I just have a thing that says, give me data. That, that could be my Jira ticket. Uh, this is super easy to exploit. It's pretty common. Pretty easy to detect. Again, just looking at that tools. Um, and the tech impact is, is moderate. So developers, we're, you know, we like to, you know, send as much data as we need in one call. We don't want to necessarily have a ton of calls going back and forth, or we may just not know what's kind of happening on the other side with the data. So we're unknowingly sending something extra along in a request. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, related to, um, maybe it's some sort of e-commerce thing, um, and maybe it's a comment or it's a review on something. And you've got a user attached to that record. Um, the front end may not display the you know, home address of that person, uh, but the back end is sending it. Um, usually it's more or less accidental through you know, just nested responses, um, you know, having a, an object on another object on another object and just serializing that entire chain. But you can have leaks of the user data or even your internal operational data. So it's important to pay attention to these. Going back to that first uh, Uber example, um, I had shown you, you know, how it was you could get a, uh, a user's ID from the system by getting a um, email address or phone number. Here's using that user ID on another endpoint and getting back essentially all the data on this user um, that, that they've got in the database. Um, it was about 150 lines or so of JSON, uh, the example that I had, um, name, phone number, email, um, a URL to point to wherever their picture, profile picture thing stored uh, in Uber systems, the date of birth, but then even creepier stuff like the latitude and longitude of where the user signed up. Um, I was like, mm, that's a little weird. Um, Lime is also though had this issue, and this one I actually think is a little bit more a better example of that operational data. Um, somebody was able to a company actually in in Israel was able to take an endpoint and see that um, that it takes in essentially a bounding box of latitudes and longitudes uh, and creates this bounding box of okay what scooters are in this area. So just playing around with this request, you can see cool I've got you know, a bike at this location, last time it was used, what the battery is like, all these sorts of super fun things for all these deep, for all these uh, scooters. So what could you do? One is you could actually figure out, okay, it went off the grid, or this the scooter stopped showing up, um, you know, at this point, um, and then, you know, maybe 10 minutes later, it popped back up over here, Pretty easy to tell. Okay, cool. They went from whatever this, I guess, Japan, no, that's Japan. They went from here to there on the scooter. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a potential right or privacy issue. Um, if you're kind of able to narrow it down and understand, you know, where people are living. Um, but also that's competitive intelligence that, you know, um, maybe Bird or Lyft or uh, whatever the new thing is um, that hasn't been banned yet. Um, you know, it's information that they would love to have. They'd love to already know the busiest times their service is being used in this weird graph that looks kind of like a cat's head, I think. Um, but like that's great information for somebody to have internally, but externally, eh, we, we invested in all, all the scooters and all the software. It'd be nice to not just have it out for everybody to see. Preventing it, you need to inventory your PII, your personally identifiable information. Um, while you're doing development, ask, you know, who's using this data? Who's using this endpoint? Do they need this data coming from this endpoint? Um, similarly, you should be auditing the endpoints. Um, you could be even throwing automation at it, you know, having automated tests assert that, okay, these endpoints called with this data, uh, with this request, come back with this response that matches and, you know, flag at any time you're seeing extra um, properties come back on your responses. 
API 4 is lack of resources and rate limiting, something that developers honestly don't think a lot about, um, or at least me, I, I guess I'll say that. I don't think about it. I'm usually just focused on writing the code. Um, again, it's average exploitability. This can be really widespread. Not a lot of APIs necessarily have this thought out. Um, super easy to detect because somebody just has to keep hitting on points and see if they get like a ear response saying, hey, cool off. Um, but your impact cam is, is moderate. Again, not usually a developer concern. Um, maybe if you're more on the ops side of things, you do think about this. Um, we got potential attacks and the den denial of service attacks, um, either standard or the distributed kind, um, as well as those brute force attacks. Um, if you don't have rate limiting, um, somebody's able to super easily just try out all you know combinations of six-digit codes that you know could possibly be sent in SMSs. You end up with downtime, um, potential account compromises. And otherwise, um, eroded trust. You know whether or not your service is up or down, or accounts get compromised. People aren't necessarily going to be super into your service if they know that this has happened. Um, this has happened to Facebook. Uh, interestingly enough, um, they do have rate limits on their password reset functionality, um, and there is the six-digit fun little code that gets texted to you if you say, "Hey, I forgot my password." That's all in their production environments. It's not turned on in their open beta environment um, that anybody can use. Um, it's an open beta environment that does actually use production data. Um, so, you know, that's them using us to do free testing. Um, so this researcher, again, Anand Prakash, was able to use that, um, use the password reset endpoint in the beta environment and because there was no rate limiting, was able to just try all combinations of those six digit codes uh, and be able to log into somebody's account. Wow, that is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one, uh, that one was pretty, that was, that was kind of a big deal. Um, I think you got 25 grand for finding that. So there's good money in this if you guys are interested. Um, so this also happened to Stack Overflow. Um, there's a category called regular or yeah, regular expression based denial of service. Um, this is a regex that they came up with to trim the beginning and ending spaces off of a line. Um, however, that doesn't work super well when the line is like these two dashes followed by 20,000 spaces, um, which like somehow ended up in like some code snippet put in a stack overflow answer for like a SQL thing. Um, that overall ends up being uh, a lot of times of checks. Uh, that was what um, just under 200 ish million a million checks that has to happen. So yeah, um, takes a little bit of time. Um, I love that they say this regular expression has been replaced with a substring function, um, uh, which I guess is slightly more. Uh, I don't know. It may be it may be more performant. It may be less performant, but at least it's more secure. So preventing this. Um, I recommend implementing rate limiting um, or some other mechanisms to avoid rate, uh, avoid these sorts of attacks from happening. Um, FYI, there's a newer um, return status or uh, response status of HTTP 429 too many requests. Um, a couple of years ago, this used to be known um, from Twitter as HTTP 420 enhance your calm. Um, that didn't fly with the all you know, engineers um, at the IETF, so they came up with too many requests to be uh, a bit more kosher of a, of a response. Um, consider global request limits. Just overall, um, you say the, the maximum content length of data you know coming into your system uh, or even coming out of your system. Um, that could be a um, an indication of something going wrong if you're getting either a bunch of data coming in or a whole lot of data that's trying to go out. Um, and you can also uh, limit system resource usage. A lot of us may be familiar with this from like virtual machines, um, where you know you can say, okay, I only use one core and only use you know two gigs of RAM for you know some tiny little service. Um, but this actually does also exist out in the in the world of containers um, and things like Docker. Docker actually has ways that you can tweak these knobs and only give so much CPU um, to a particular container. Um, 
I think a lot of the service, serverless um, setups also do have ways you can do this now. Um, just kind of a way to kind of bring your system in and prevent kind of this sorts of thing from kind of taking over and otherwise, you know, taking down your service. Jumping into number five, broken functional authorization. Um, complex access control policies tend to lead to authorization flaws. Um, one thing is, this actually sounds a lot like the first one, because it is a lot like the first one, the broken object level authorization. This is actually, you know, a smaller facet of maybe I can see something, but I shouldn't be able to do something with it. Um, maybe I should be able to read this blog post, but I shouldn't be able to delete the blog post or update the blog post. Um, easy to exploit. It can, it's common, but it's hard to detect. It takes some amount of time to figure out what endpoints are vulnerable to this. Um, but the impact, yeah, it's moderate because you can do fun things like delete or update records um, and systems. But broken down, essentially, authorization code gets complicated if you've got you know complex business rules and you've got things like roles and rights and groups and this intersection of them, and a user needs to satisfy a whole bunch of things. So attackers are able to find and exploit bugs in, in that logic. Or they just get lucky. You know, they happen to find something like changing the verb um, in the HTTP request or just tweaking the URL, uh, cha changing, say, maybe you've got, you know, slash user slash blah, blah, blah in your URL. And they say, OK, cool. Let's try slash admins slash blah, blah, blah and see what happens. In the end, attackers get unauthorized functionality. Usually admin uh, is what it comes down to with this. They usually get something that only administrators should be able to do. Uh, and this can just throw your entire system integrity um, into kind of a questionable state. You don't know who maybe has touched what if you don't have other controls in place. Um, here is an example from New Relic. Um, an attacker can create a new account inside any partnership this is a client and, and partner or service provider relationship with no approval from the partnership owner. You know, that's no big deal. Just being able to create uh, any um, account inside of it and be able to get to somebody else's data. Um, or Shopify, you know, allowing a, somebody to approve their own request uh, to be a collaborator uh, on a shop. Similar, very, very same. Uh, circumstances. Preventing this, it's a little, it can be difficult. Um, you need to include things like an API-wide API mechanism that kind of secure by default middleware that I talked about in the first uh, broken object level authorization um, risk. You should also review your endpoints, you know, what shouldn't most users be able to do, and then add additional checks for any special administrative functionality. Again, that's kind of your defense in depth approach, making sure that you know, people that can't do things that they shouldn't be able to. Jumping along into number six, mass assignment. You know, developers uh, may do things without proper properties filtering based on a allow list, um, allowing attackers to modify object properties they're not supposed to. Uh, average exploitability, common prevalence. It takes a little bit of work to detect, uh, and the impact is moderate. Kind of very middle of the road, um, considering that these are all three-point scale, and this one is two. Um, but in other words, you know, dev helpers or conveniences get turned against us, um, and the attacker may be able to observe the response to gets uh, to endpoints on your API and see sensitive fields. Maybe there is a is admin field or account locked field or account balance field. Is admin account balance thing created by those things. Um, maybe they're able to then take those fields and update them using typically put or patch endpoints. Um, post can be abused, but it's usually the put and the patch endpoints that uh, tend to have these issues. Um, Attackers are able to bypass security, um, escalate their privi privileges, and tamper with data. So this time, I've got an example from Harbor, an open source uh, container registry or artifact registry. So it secures things. It makes sure that you know images are scanned and 
don't have any vulnerabilities, and it signs images as trusted. Kind of a big deal. You don't want the system to just not, you know, be untrustworthy. Well, they had a bug in their Go, Go code um, right over here. So you see here's a post endpoint posting user data. It goes through here and uses a built-in thing in, in Go, this decode JSON request uh, endpoint. And you know it's just checking to make sure that this doesn't return an error. And if there's an error return, it will case send a bad request. But if this these the serializes correctly, well then, um, or rather serial, yeah, serializes, um, it's just going to keep going on its very many its its happy way. So normally the payload may look like something like this with the username, email, these sorts of fun things. But there is an internal has admin role field. Um, that you know, if you know that it's there, which this is open source, so it's pretty easy to see what is or isn't there. Um, you can just add in this has admin role, true, and congratulations, you now have a brand new admin user that you didn't expect. Um, or you can ask a fun little company called GitHub. This is from March 2012, uh, and a, a commit into the main Rails repository. Um, not quite, you know, the typical Rails commit of, you know, Rails at vulnerabilities. Um, the guy did get some flack for this because he didn't necessarily disclose it correctly or responsibly. Um, but it was pretty simple. I simply added a input field uh, on a public key update form. Uh, GitHub allows you to update, you know, the SSH keys that you've got. Um, and he just said, okay, I'm going to just throw the user ID into this form that gets posted to the server. And I'm going to say the public key um, for the user ID of the Rails organization. And that's that's all it was. Um, and, you know, that could, you know, very, be very easy to, you know, get code into repositories that wasn't, that wasn't expected. Since, I mean, everybody's using GitHub nowadays, it seems. Finding it, um, avoid auto binding. Um, things that, you know, allow you to just say, okay, cool, I'm going to take all this input and just assign it to properties on, on a given object. Um, look at creating allow lists of your properties um, on those objects, though, that, you know, you can use things like annotations, attributes to kind of say, hey, these are the things that can be edited, updated from the client side. Um, but also look at input validation schemas. Um, again, you can use, there's a couple of JSON schemas that are out there um, that you could use to kind of pre-filter the data coming in and making sure that the request from the client isn't uh, unexpected or potentially uh, gonna hurt you. Security misconfiguration is one that I've been finding kind of interesting. You know, having unsecured default configurations um, like open cloud storage, uh, settings, um, no HTTP headers or misbehaving, HTTP headers, uh, verbose error messages. Super easy to exploit, super easy to be found. It's widespread. Uh, it's easy to detect uh, and it has moderate uh, impact. So in other words, this is things like missing or incorrect hardening of your servers or applications. Uh, you may have overly permissive code service settings, so you know allowing things to be uploaded into buckets um, or storage accounts that shouldn't be, you know, publicly accessible, or missing or weak TLS, aka SSL. Um, you could also be missing things like security headers for core policies is a big one now, um, or systems and libraries could be unpatched, and otherwise information disclosure through things like stack traces or other error messages. This leads to data exposure and potentially getting your servers owned. Um, we'll talk about that uh, with two good examples. But first, I actually want to give an example of something that I found interesting researching uh, the HTTP trace verb. The trace verb uh, actually means the server is going to echo back the entire HTTP request it received. That includes the off headers, which you know are only kind of secure. This actually pairs really well with cross site scripting attacks because then the person on the receiving end of this request is able to say, okay, cool, or that gets the response back rather, um, is able to steal those off header values and be able to you know, do whatever that user can do in your application. I've got you know, super obscure 
um, example here from a small company called Equifax. Uh, this starts out with CVE 2017-5683, which is a vulnerability in Apache struts. Um, basically, there's a library um, that attempted to include a content type value in an error message, but it accidentally parses whatever that content type is and executes the code. All up. Um, it was fixed on March 7th. I forget how early it was found, um, but it was actively exploited um, out in the real world by March 10th. So once this was dropped, it only took a couple days for people to be trying this everywhere. So of course, it happened to Equifax. Uh, on May 12th of 2017, it was exploited on uh, their credit dispute website. Uh, it took until July 29th to be discovered, and then the next day they were able to verify that it was fixed and deployed. Impact, um, from what we can tell, is nearly 150 million American consumer records accessed. I think when the last number I saw was like 147.5. Uh, somewhere between 10 and 11 million people's driver's licenses also um, got out there. So not just your credit, but also your, your driver's license, which, you know, just more personal data out there for everybody to see. Um, this also happened to GitHub, um, which was interesting. Um, Rails has a default behavior for handling the HTTP head verb. Um, if your code doesn't normally do anything with it, it's just gonna say, okay, this must be, this should be handled by like a Git request instead. Um, their OAuth authorized endpoint though, uh, was slightly vulnerable here uh, in mixing up the code paths that would, would be followed by any of these requests. So kind of in some more pseudocode we've got in the, in the Rails router code, you know, we match um, the authorized endpoint to the authorized controller um, with the get or the post. There's no, you know, deny list that says don't do the, the head verb, that, that's a bad one. And in the controller, you know, if it's a get, um, it serves the off page HTML. Otherwise, it grants permissions to this app through the OAuth endpoint. Um, what happens in backend for GitHub's code is it actually realizes that there's some authorization stuff coming back across. I'm saying, hey, this is an app wanting to be authorized. So it actually says, okay, I, you must mean to go to the post flow instead. So then it routes everything through the post flow, um, allowing cross-site request forgery because it's missing the, the token that would normally prevent this sort of thing. Meaning the application is able to get arbitrary permissions for that user without any approval. So, you know, just owning all your code all the time. Preventing it involves environment hardening. You may want to automate this sort of stuff or, you know, talk with ops people about it. Um, reviewing your configurations for both your application as well as any of the cloud services that are being used. Again, those open buckets in AWS S3 uh, is a big example. Uh, making sure you always use TLS, um, that you're disabling unused verbs uh, being used Again, the header example. Uh, and then uh, configuring um, security headers, things like cores or cross origin resource sharing, HSTS, which basically says browser only use HTTPS for this thing, or CSP, which is content security policy. API 8 2019 is injection. Now, it's this one. We have to have little bottom tables in any security presentation, um, I've learned. Definitely. Um, but this is any time input isn't validated, filtered, or sanitized. You know, especially if this data is actually being passed through, you know, straight into the database, you know, for a query, which is bad, or straight to the OS, which is bad, or into parsers, particularly XML parsers tend to be really bad at this. Um, but a good thing to note is also think about external systems. Don't think just about you know, APIs that users may be using normally in day-to-day -day stuff, but think about any integration endpoints where you have you know, a partner application talking to your API. Implications of this, um, information disclosure, denial of service, or even be able to take over uh, the host. A good example of information disclosure is actually from Starbucks back in May 2019. Um, they use the backend for front end pattern. So you can see here's a URL. 
uh, with a proxy kind of hanging out in the middle. Um, and somebody figured out that, okay, cool, I can just go to like this normal endpoint and then add slash dot dot, slash dot, slash dot dot. That's basically going up a whole bunch of directories on a file system or some other similar system. And they found that doing this, they would actually get lots of production accounts hitting this particular endpoint uh, to the tune of, um, you know, what is this, just under 100 million um, accounts were registered out there. Um, this was, here's the um, account side of things, but also barcodes, loyalty, settings for apps, all that fun stuff. Um, turns out that Starbucks is actually using uh, Microsoft Graph uh, internally, um, which has a OData uh, query language, which is a lot like GraphQL if you've used that. Um, so just by figuring out, oh, okay, cool, it's Microsoft Graph, I can now go in and figure out all these different things based off of um, creating those valid OData queries. This also happened to VMware back in 2019 and one of their products, um, remote code execution. Uh, I know it's gonna be a little hard to see, but down here, there's updating the, the host for an SMTP server to send email addresses. They put in um, dollar sign uh, bracket seven times seven, close bracket, and they found string value has in valid format value 49. So they found a place that, okay, cool. The application evaluated this thing. So using reflection abilities of Java, um, yet another example of why reflection is evil, should be avoided. They were able to figure out how to run shell commands. So they were able to do a whole bunch of magic, get class to name, you know, a whole bunch of stuff in here. Um, and eventually called bash. Um, and you can see here, cool. Uh, they get the, the unit of the user that's running, the group ID, uh, and any of, of the groups that they're in. Um, they were able to do this and actually do some more directory traversal sort of stuff and be able to get credentials to essentially all of the different cloud accounts that were hanging out in here. Because um, this is a product that gets used usually by like a service provider with a bunch of clients. So not only are you getting owned, but all your clients are getting owned at the same time. It's lovely. Preventing this, again, validating the external data coming in, filtering it, sanitizing it, using safe interfaces um, to things like SQL, um, as well as doing things like limiting records uh, returned, um, you know, like that Starbucks example, um, you could potentially have some flags and, and some things turned on so that, you know, you don't necessarily have as much data exposed right away. Um, moving on to improper assets management, because I see it run close on time. Um, this is things like deprecated APIs that are still hanging out there. Um, so again, an old API, maybe it doesn't have the fixes to things. Maybe you've got, you know, a test endpoint uh, or test environment with not all the protections in place. Um, or it could just be poor docs or communication. I, as a developer, don't know that there's still the old buggy code out there and the ops people don't know that they could get rid of it. Again, accessing sensitive data and account takeovers are sorts of things that can happen with this. Airtel is India's number three mobile provider. Um, they had an unsecured test environment API, so it gave a whole bunch of fun information like name, date of birth, address, and the IMEI of what their user's cell phones. I uh, like that, yes. That was just a technical issue in one of the APIs um, when, they, when they told the BBC. Um, a good example, I think, for developers is Firebase. 4.8% uh, of mobile apps using Firebase not properly secured. Uh, this is a Bing search result because Google actually occasionally scrubs these off of your search results, but Microsoft doesn't have to. Why would Microsoft care? Um, but here is just JSON of like all the users tables from a couple of this Android chat app redacted. Um, so again, if you're using something like Firebase, make sure you've got your configuration set up correctly, preventing it, inventorying your API, the, you know, the service that you've got out there, versions of code that you've got out there, protecting those APIs with rate limiting and uh, reviewing old versions of code, backporting critical fixes if you can't decommission something altogether. Uh, and finally, uh, number 10, sufficient logging and monitoring. Um, 
This is, you know, essentially allowing people to just stay in your system, hanging out, doing whatever they want to do. Um, this is actually a good example of what happened to Equifax, too. Um, people are in their systems for two months without them knowing. Um, so yeah, this is usually not logging enough, like code um, or configuration, not monitoring those logs or things being produced by your infrastructure. It can take um, it can take a lot of time to find um, in instances of this, um, leading attackers to have tons of time to just kind of poke around your system and find all the stuff they want to. And then when you do realize it, you don't realize how bad you've been compromised. Um, Venmo has this thing where they just kind of show to the public all the things going on. Um, so people have scraped like 7 million Venmo transactions. Um, so please secure your Venmo stuff, set all your transactions to private. Um, you can go to this GitHub repo down here uh, and download a torrent of them. There's a lot. Um, then there's also this First American Financial Corporation, which is a title insurance company. Anyone who knew the URL for a valid document could view other documents by modifying a single digit in the link. So, hey, here's seller information on some property. So cool, they figured out that, okay, we've got an issue with object level authorization, just being able to enumerate IDs, but now they don't know what records have been accessed or who's accessed them. Uh, and that's 885 million files potentially exposed um, just on the public web. There was no authentication. Super great. Preventing this, pretty simple. Add more logging, things like failed authentication or authorization um, access attempts, um, input validation errors if you're getting like craziness with like um, injection attempts. Better logging. Um, I recommend two minutes, just a quick hit. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. Um, better logging, structured logging, or and making sure there's enough details in it, uh, and finally monitoring those logs. Um, things like um, there's different systems like Splunk, um, you know, creating dashboards and setting up alerts, and maybe your cloud provider to make sure that you see you get that information as soon as possible. Here again is the OWASP API security top ten. I'm right about at time, so I'm not going to grab them all off, but I will say. Um, here are a couple resources. Uh, first is OWASP itself at OWASP.org. Um, there's a link to the um, projects uh, for API security. They also have a GitHub repo. And I also recommend apisecurity.io, which has a weekly security newsletter on API vulnerabilities, uh, as well as kind of an encyclopedia that goes into all details on these um, and some other things that can be wrong in APIs. Um, I'm right at time, so I don't think I've got any time for questions, but I do want to thank you guys for hanging out for an hour listening to me. Uh, I want to thank Lee for being an amazing host uh, and dealing with wrangling a whole bunch of uh, presenters that didn't think that we needed to deal with teams um, being buggy on a weekend. Turns out teams is buggy all the time. Um, True story. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Hey, thank you, Tim. That was wonderful.